Over on Jaguar Gator 7, a new baseball video is out. In this video, we talk about the player on the Chicago White Sox who retired and then unretired in the span of one day. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. It's funny how the 1980 NFL Draft played out if you look at it closely. Over the final 20 picks of the fifth round, from picks 119 to 138, there were four defensive backs taken. Two of them actually went on to have successful and prosperous careers in the NFL. One of them was this man right here, pick number 131, Denver Broncos defensive back Mike Hardin, who played 11 seasons in the NFL and recorded 38 interceptions. He spent nine seasons with the Broncos and two with the Raiders, started 125 games, and was a key part in Denver's secondary as they made it to the Super Bowl in back-to-back -back seasons, when they made it to Super Bowl 21 during the 1986 season and Super Bowl 22 during the 1987 season, as he led the team in interceptions in both years. Of course, if you remember Harden today, it might not be for any of that, but rather for the feud he had with Seattle Seahawks wide receiver Steve Largent, and the hit that Largent laid on Harden and vice versa. But make no mistake about it, Harden was an awfully good player that is still remembered fondly in Broncos history to this day for his contributions on the field. And the other one was this man right here, pick number 137, Atlanta Falcons defensive back Kenny Johnson, who played 10 seasons in the NFL, playing throughout the 1980s while starting 81 games, including 78 for the Falcons. He recorded 17 interceptions, and in 1983, led the NFL with two pick sixes, with both of them coming in the same game against the Green Bay Packers. If you know Kenny Johnson best, it's probably for that 1983 class against the Packers, where he had a pick six in the fourth quarter against Lynn Dickey to give the Falcons a 41-34 lead, and then had the game-winning walk-off pick six in overtime to win at 47-41. He even led the Falcons in 1984 in interceptions, recording five picks and doing the bulk of the work from a ball hawk standpoint after the rest of the team had just seven combined, with no one having more than two. Especially considering that this is the fifth round we're talking about, and the fact that both of these players were pretty good, I think the Broncos and Falcons had to be pleased with their fifth round selections of Mike Harden and Kenny Johnson, respectively. But I did mention that there were four defensive backs taken in that 20 pick stretch. And oddly enough, both of the other ones came courtesy of the Buffalo Bills, who had pick number 119 and pick number 129. And while I did say that two of the defensive backs had successful and prosperous careers in the NFL, the other two, as in the ones that Buffalo drafted in that stretch, well, they did not. Not at all. Buffalo kind of whiffed badly in the fifth round of the 1980 NFL draft when they tried to double down a defensive back and got no one. However, it's not that they whiff that's the focus of our story, because let's be honest, it's the fifth round of the draft, and you're not going to hit on everyone. Heck, there were 10 guys in the fifth round from 1980 alone who never even so much as played a down in the NFL. As a general manager and a scouting department, you're not going to be judged off of the strength of your fifth round picks but it's the way that they whiff that deserves a deep dive, especially considering the two defensive backs that went straight after. Because in 1980, the Buffalo Bills had an absolutely bizarre strategy that, safe to say, did not work out at all, and one that we might never see attempted ever again because of how badly it failed and because of just how out there it truly was. Because this is the story behind what might just be, in the over 60-year history of the Buffalo Bills franchise, the strangest draft strategy in team history. Before I talk about the actual draft strategy, and in particular, the two men that they drafted that did not pan out, we need some context to understand how Buffalo's secondary was looking going into the 1980 season, as well as what they were doing in the draft beforehand. And honestly, 
as you're able to tell, while the Bills had their struggles in 1979, going 7-9 and and collapsing by losing their final three games down the stretch, it wasn't because of their secondary. In fact, their secondary was quite good. They were 6th in the NFL in passing yards allowed, allowing just over 158 yards per game. They were 7th in the NFL in completion percentage allowed, as opposing quarterbacks were only completing 50.5% of their passes against them, at a time where the league-wide average was somewhere around 54%. They were 8th in the league in interceptions, recording 24. They were 5th in passer rating allowed, as opposing quarterbacks only had a passer rating of 59.8 against them, at a time where the league-wide average was a hair above 70. And they only allowed 14 passing touchdowns all season, which was the fourth best total in the NFL and comes out to less than one per game. Plus, as an added bonus, the team was bringing back three starters and was on the younger side, with no one on the 1979 team outside of Tony Green, who would retire after the season, over the age of 26. This was a secondary that was in pretty good condition, all things considered. And with that in mind, even though reinforcements would be nice, I guess Buffalo thought that they could experiment a little bit. They didn't need guys to step in right away and assume starting positions. They were pretty well set in the defensive backfield based off of everything that happened the previous year. So they could afford to draft some risky guys with super high risk, but super high potential. You could draft guys based off of traits alone. And if it doesn't work out, eh, it's a fifth round pick. It still stinks, but it's not the end of the world. If it does work out, well, you might have found yourselves a star and a hidden gem that no one else saw. And you didn't necessarily have to ruin their development by forcing them to play straight away and develop bad techniques and habits. Because again, you're pretty set. With Buffalo's first five picks, they did absolutely nothing in the secondary. They spent the picks trying to improve their offense, that was 23rd in the league out of 28 teams, and ended the season scoring three points in their last two games combined, and scored a whopping 114 points over their final 11 games, or just over 10 points per game, while getting shut out twice. In fact, their first five draft picks were all spent on the offensive side of the ball. But with the fifth round here, the Bills finally decided to pick up some defenders. And with their first pick in the fifth round, which was pick number 119, they chose this man right here out of Georgia, Jeff Piper. However, right off the bat, you might have noticed something bizarre about Piper. And that's the fact that, well, he's not a defensive back. At the very least, he wasn't one in college. In fact, he was a quarterback. Now, Pyburn wasn't a very good quarterback in college. He got benched during the 1979 season after throwing one touchdown and seven interceptions. However, he did have his moments where he showed potential, especially during the 1978 season, when he was fifth in the conference in passing touchdowns, had a positive touchdown to interception ratio, and helped guide the Bulldogs to an appearance in the Blue Bonnet Bowl against Stanford. But again, this was a man who had only played offense, and even though his dad, coincidentally, was the defensive backs coach at Georgia during this time, was not a defensive back in the slightest bit, having no experience whatsoever at the position. He was fast, running a 4-5-40, and actually started his career off as a running back, but was never a player on the opposite side of the ball. Yet, the Bills drafted him, hoping that his skills and his speed would translate to that position. And this was not like the Bill Nelson saga from 1963, when the Steelers drafted that quarterback to play defensive back purely as a disguise, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. This one was legit. They actually wanted to play him at defensive back. Just like that, Georgia's quarterback was now Buffalo's newest defensive back. But okay, even though this might seem bizarre, there's nothing too unusual about this just yet. 
we've seen plenty of players get drafted at positions that they never played before, making the switch to a different skill set, or even a different side of the ball from college to the pros. You've got guys like Arkansas wide receiver Matt Jones, who was a quarterback in college and got drafted by the Jaguars in the first round. You've got guys like Kent State wide receiver Julian Edelman, who was a quarterback in college and got drafted by the Patriots in the seventh round. I think it's safe to say that choosing Edelman worked out well. Heck, going into the 2020 NFL Draft, at the NFL Combine, there were 46 players who got invited that were asked to also work out at a second position, or a position that they did not play in college. So the decision for the Bills to draft Pyburn and have him play defensive back, on its own, isn't bizarre. Rather, it's what they did next that raised some eyebrows because the next time they were on the clock, they had pick number 129. And with that pick, they chose this man right here out of Colorado State, Keith Lee. But just like Pyburn, you probably noticed something odd about Lee that seems out of place. And that is the fact that, just like Pyburn, Lee wasn't a defensive back in college. He was a quarterback. Again, I'd hesitate to say that Lee was a good quarterback. Colorado State primarily ran the triple option, so they relied a ton on Lee using his legs. And to be fair to Lee, he had some success doing this. He was inside the top 10 of the WAC in rushing touchdowns in 1978, and was 7th in the conference in rushing attempts in 1979. But he was not the best quarterback by a long shot. He only completed 44% of his passes missed some wide open reads, and not only had a negative touchdown to interception ratio in both seasons with the Rams, seeing as he was initially enrolled at Santa Monica Community College, but had a poor ratio of 1-2 to two during the 1979 season. Still, despite having no experience whatsoever at the position of defensive back, the Bills liked his speed, seeing as he ran a 4-5-5-40, and decided to draft him to play defensive back. Again, to draft one quarterback to play defensive back, while it might seem bizarre, is one thing. It's happened before. But to draft two of them? And to do it in back-to-back -back picks? And to do it with other very good defensive backs on the board? Seeing as, again, the next two defensive backs chosen after these two, even with the benefit of hindsight, were guys who played defensive back in college, and went on to have very successful careers in the NFL that any GM would have been thrilled with? Yeah, that is an incredibly bold strategy that is going to raise some eyebrows. As Bill's chief scout Norm Pollum said, we'll start them both at cornerback. They have cornerback speed and movement. This was a move purely reliant on intangibles rather than anything else. It was a relatively decent sized gamble to throw away two picks like this especially since he only had five picks left and didn't have a sixth or seventh round pick to work with. So he weren't going to be on the clock for a while, which raises the question, did it work? Well, seeing as the two men played a combined total of zero games for the Bills, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that no, no it did not. Jeff Piper never played a down in the NFL. Instead, choosing to spurn the Bills in order to pursue a career in baseball. Pyburn was an all-SEC player at Georgia, got drafted in the first round with pick number 5 by the San Diego Padres, and actually made it all the way up to AAA in 1982 before tearing his knee, ending his career. However, he did get invited to Bills camp in 1983, though that didn't go anywhere. And Keith Lee played a few seasons in the NFL, playing four years with the New England Patriots and one with the Indianapolis Colts, but did not spend any time with the Bills. This scandal did not pay off whatsoever, especially since the two defensive backs taken after them were both very good players in the league for a very long time, and these two defensive backs combined to play zero games for Buffalo. Look, the NFL draft is often about taking calculated gambles and thinking outside the box. But sometimes, you can get a little too extreme, and that might be what the Bills did here. The Bills bought one too many lottery tickets here. 
drafting back-to-back -back players with relatively decent picks who had no experience playing the position and spurning actual defensive backs to choose guys who may or may not know how to play defensive back was not their finest moment. Because generally speaking, the guys who make the best defensive backs in the NFL are the guys who played defensive back before. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.